Welcome to Remnant Stew, the podcast that proves the world is full of wonder and intrigue. I'm Steve. And I'm Leah. And today we'll be talking about sharks, tattoos, murder, smelly treasure, and strange vomit. Oh, can't wait. Do you have an appetite for the curious and downright bizarre? Then you've come to the right place, my friend. Pull up a chair and grab a spoon for today's intriguing serving of Remnant Stew. Steve, do you know what a metaphobia is? Uh, boy, I don't think I know that one. I metaphobia. Well, it's a phobia, so it's okay. a fear. I see. Some people have this uh, debil- debilitating fear of vomiting. Oh, yeah. They're they're absolutely, well, they're afraid to vomit, so they avoid it at all costs, which right. isn't healthy. But uh, but some people are just really, they just have a strong aversion to any anyone talking about it or anything, and I wanted to give a heads up. If there's any emetophobes out there or emetophobes, <laughs> Uh, we are going to be talking about vomit, and uh, but we're not going to be gross or graphic. But no. just in case, you've been warned. This will be pleasant vomit. Well, sort of. Uh, not really. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so I have a funny story about vomit. But but before we get started, like when you were little, I know when I was little. Staying home from school was the oh, best. Oh, man, that was the best, yeah. When you, <laughs> Whether you were if, Especially sick. if you really weren't all that sick, you know, you could convince uh, mom that you were, you didn't feel well, and so you could stay home, lay on the couch, and watch TV, and, you know, favorite TV shows like Price is Right. The or, Price is Right. Yeah, I love Price is Right. Still love Price is Right. And, <laughs> and, and so, saltines, right? right? Eat, yeah, saltines and um, Sprite. Sprite. Yeah, have some Sprite for sure, yeah. And then hearing the school bus go by at the end of the day and realize, yeah, they were all in school and I had a nice day at home. All those suckers. <laughs> well, uh, I've, I've got a funny story. So my, I have four kids. And right. so my youngest son, Joe, who's, who's number three, he would get, he would sneak in our room because he wasn't supposed to do this and he knew it, but he did it anyway. He would sneak in our room, get up on our bed uh-huh. and go through the top of the dresser where my husband oh, dumped yeah. all of his stuff and he would go through all of it and find anything remotely edible right and and he would eat it uh whether it was mints or gum or candy and so and, and all of this is happening while i'm in the kitchen with the other kids y- y- yeah that time of the day with the dinner and the baths and the homework and exactly uh, so when I called everyone in for dinner, Joe smelled suspiciously minty. <laughs> like for a three-year-old, that is suspicious, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? And he, incredibly minty. And we found out that he had gotten, obviously, into mints. There were these, and they're not around anymore, but these uh, icebreaker mints that uh, weren't candy, but they were the little, they were little, BB size. Oh, I remember those. They were kind of hard pearl looking things. That's almost. right. Yeah. That's right. And they were super strong. And when you bit into them, then it was like a blast. I remember those. It's like yeah. Yeah, face punch of mint. Exactly. And, <laughs> and we realized he had eaten uh, probably about 30 of them. That's a lot of mint. Okay. <laughs> and for a, a three year old. For a three year old. Right. And I knew. I knew it was going to be an interesting night, and it was. Uh He woke me up, and I went in there just dreading, you know. And with four kids, I'm a Uh biohazardous waste expert. Um, (laughs) Exactly. And we went in there, and uh, I I start pulling the bed sheets off, and... Let me tell you, it was the most refreshingly minty smell. <laughs> <laughs> it was the, the nicest smelling vomit yes, I had it ever was vomit, cleaned up. But it smelled minty fresh. I put all of his, his bed clothes in the washing machine, and when I went to take them out to put them in the dryer, pulled them out and got this, again, a <laughs> whiff of mint and just stuffed them back in there and had to wash them again. So if you'd like for your vomit to be minty fresh, make sure you eat the icebreaker hard pearls, 30 of them at least. That's right. That's right. Make it smell That's wonderful. pretty interesting. A metaphobia, okay? So it has to do with fear of vomiting. That's right. And so, speaking of that, our story today takes place in 1935 when a man okay. fishing off the coast of Australia caught something. Uh-huh. As he was reeling it in, he saw that he had snagged a small shark. 
Before he got into the boat, however, a larger shark came up and swallowed that smaller shark. So he's reeling in one shark, and another another shark comes and bites that shark? That's right. And, so, and this catch turned out to be a four-meter-long shark. He caught both of the sharks. He caught both of the sharks. Oh. And, he pull, and he managed to pull this in at four meters. For us Yanks, is over 13 feet. Right. So it's not a little one. That's a pretty good-sized shark. Dare I say it's not a baby shark. No. Um, he took it. <laughs> he kept it alive. He brought it into the boat, somehow kept it alive, and he took it to nearby Kuji Aquarium which gladly put the shark on display alive in an aquarium. Mm -hmm. They knew it was going to be a popular attraction because sharks were very much on the minds of the local people at that right. time. There had been three local deaths due to shark attacks in that year alone, and it was only April. Oh, that's a bad year. <laughs> well, and sharks get a bad rap. They really do. I mean, I know that three deaths in, in that short period of time is a lot, but... You are more likely to die from a coconut falling on your head. Well, no, that's never been anything that I've been feared of. So, I so can <laughs> that you've never been a feared of. Never been a feared of. Yeah. <laughs> so, how about cows? You are more likely to be killed by a yeah, cow. I can understand that. Yeah. Okay, than a shark. Uh, and we see. I've seen a lot more cows anyway. Then. Yeah, than here in sharks. Texas, we we're coming to you from beautiful Montgomery County, Texas, and that's uh, we do have a lot of cows here for sure. Yeah, I can. I don't know about a cow attacking. But I can absolutely see driving into a, yeah, a rogue I've, cow. I have seen that happen, yeah. So go, going back to sharks, though, out of okay. more than 480 shark species, only three of those are known to for fatal, unprovoked attacks on humans. Do mm -hmm. you have a guess? Do you have any guesses of what those are? Well, um, from Jaws, of course, I'd guess the great white. That would, uh, great white uh, shark would be the, the number one, I would bet. That's that's it. That's number one. And let's say I don't, what the sharks do I know? I know of tiger sharks. The tiger shark. I and, can't think of any other kind of shark. And then there's the bull shark. Bull shark. And so the well, they were back to cows again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> so the the shark that was on display was actually a tiger tiger shark, a thirteen okay. foot tiger shark, and it did attract a lot of attention for several days. <clears throat> I say, yeah, but I would imagine so. That is until April twenty fifth, when the shark became very distressed. And it started thrashing about in the aquarium, and then in front of all these spectators, uh -huh. the shark vomited up a human arm. Get out of town, really? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine taking your family to the aquarium? Look, hon. Look, look kids. Uh, the shark. Oh, he's throwing up an arm. Look at that. <laughs> wow. So at first, most everyone thought they were seeing the result of another shark attack. The display was closed down. The animal was taken from the tank, killed, and gutted to see if there were any other human remains to be found. Mm. Uh, they didn't find any more. And upon just further, an arm, they just, just an, arm, an arm, and probably that baby shark, that other, the yeah, the shark. other shark, yeah. <laughs> uh, there, so on further inspection, though, it was determined that the arm had actually not been bitten off at all. Uh -huh. It had been severed. Like with, a, well, like with a saw or an axe or something. I, it it doesn't it, it doesn't say, but it had been it had been severed with some I kind see. of tool. I see. Uh, that, along with the remains of a rope tied around the wrist of the arm, led investigators to conclude that this was evidence of a homicide. Oh, so not I a see. shark attack, but a human attack. Mm -hmm. Someone had dismembered a body. I mean, think about this: yeah. dismembered a body, dumped it into the sea, and the arm, by sheer coincidence, right. Ended up on display in an aquarium. You thought you'd got away with it, and then suddenly the arm shows up. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd love to be a fly on the wall when, the, <laughs> when that guy found out. Right. So it just so happened that the arm had a very distinctive tattoo. Oh, that get, makes it even better. You can figure out who it is. Isn't maybe. that, okay, so I watch a lot of CSI and yeah, NCIS. That Isn't that funny where they go, oh, this one, there's pollen, and it only grows in this one spot, yeah. right? So they got a break just like that. There was uh -huh. a distinctive tattoo. And it was a non-professional tattoo of oh, a man. Amateur. In, yeah, an amateur tattoo of a man in a boxing stance. Probably, and, probably done in a back alley somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> probably. Yeah. And if you go to our Facebook page uh, or our Instagram page. And please do. At Remnant Stew Podcast, you can see a picture of the tattoo in the arm. And it's not, it's not graphic. It's not, no. you can't tell that it's a severed arm. It's been cropped. It's been cropped. Well, yeah, literally. <laughs> so the, the picture has been cropped the t the of the arm. The arm has been cropped, and the picture has been cropped of the cropped arm. It's double cropped. So the tattoo and the arm was linked to a man named James Smith. Now, James right. Smith was a boxer, just as his tattoo would suggest. And according to his brother, he had been missing for several weeks. Mm -hmm. 
Police now presumed him to be dead, both murdered and dismembered. He was also known to be a petty criminal. Uh -huh. Detectives traced Smith's last movements and quickly honed in on two possible suspects, Patrick Brady and Reginald Lloyd Holmes. Okay. Both of these guys were known to by police to be pretty big criminals. They sound like scoundrels. It was determined that on the night of his disappearance, James Smith had spent some time with Patrick Brady, who was known to police as an expert forger. The next morning, Brady took a cab to the home of businessman Reginald Lloyd Holmes. Now, Holmes had a lot of ways of making money, mm -hmm. some legitimate and some yeah. not. Well, he had a, a real boat building business, but he was also known to have a fleet of very fast speedboats. Oh, speedboats were used a lot in those days. Yes, yeah. and he used it in not so legal way. Not he, legal ways, exactly. Yeah. He controlled a lucrative smuggling ring and was mm. used and he used the speedboats to bring in cocaine, cigarettes and other substances illegal in Australia around that time. Smith also worked for Holmes driving one of the speedboats. Uh-huh. And they had a falling out of some sort, and it was speculated that Smith may have resorted to blackmailing Holmes. Uh oh, that's trouble. A, that's a good way There's to end trouble up afoot in the ocean down under. Okay. All at all, the evidence was circumstantial, so police really needed a confession. Brady was arrested, and Holmes was brought in, but then he was let go when he insisted that he didn't know James Smith. Uh -huh. I never knew the guy. He says the case <laughs> stalled until May twentieth, when Reginald Holmes tried to commit suicide. This is, this is this really is odd. Wild. In a series of crazy events, Holmes boated out to the harbor, shot himself, and fell overboard. His arm got tangled in a rope, though, and <laughs> prevented him from drowning. The water revived him. Just the luck. He crawled back into his boat, and after a four hour chase, again, after almost drowning and having uh -huh. a gunshot wound, uh, he was finally intercepted by police. So, so wait, he, he was going to kill himself, but then he woke up, and then he thought, no, I've got to run from the police because uh, i got my arm stuck in this rope. Apparently. I mean, he sounds like a pretty good candidate for being the murderer, right? Uh, I would think so, yeah. Well, he was arrested, brought to the police station, and started to talk. Mm -hmm. He agreed to be a witness against Brady. Uh, so he pointed the finger at someone else who was then charged with the murder of James Smith. However... Uh -huh. The murder investigation took an uns unsuspected turn when, on June 12th, Holmes' body was found in the wee hours of the morning, slumped over the wheel of his car in some deserted docks. Mm, okay, dun, dun, so, dun. yeah, so maybe uh, maybe he, he got finished off after all then. Yeah, so when you hang with thieves and criminals, yeah, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, so the case against Brady collapsed without Holmes as a witness. I see. He was acquitted and the case stalled again. Then another suspect entered the scene. Smith had been a police nice. informant against dangerous criminal Eddie Wayman. Now, I'm just telling you, Smith doesn't seem to be the smartest guy here. Yeah, he ran with a bad crowd, it seems. Wayman was heavily involved in the cocaine trade. Police were never able to bring any charges against him, but it's speculated that Smith may have been a victim of gang-style killing uh, carried out by mm. any one of these three suspects for being a snitch. So right. snitches get stitches with his body ending up in pieces and thrown into the harbor. And so the shark arm murder case remains unsolved Man, that's to something this day. Else. That is really amazing. You know, all, all, <laughs> yeah, all those people that are involved in this, yet none of them could be charged with this murder. I, I just still can't get over the uh, image of having your family at the uh, uh, exhibit Let's look at this new shark they just caught. They've got him swimming around in here, and all of a sudden he coughs up an arm. <laughs> That's right. got to be really quite something. Let's explain that to the kids. Yeah. Why, does, why is he ca uh, coughing up an arm? <laughs> it's interesting the things that come out of the ocean. Um, you know, there's, um, there's something else I happened to come across uh, not too long ago. Leah, I don't know if you are familiar with ambergris, or as the uh, French call it, ambre gris. Now, I, I think I've heard of it, but... but pronounced the first way not right. the second way uh but i'm a little little sketchy on it go ahead and tell me about it well um according to britannica.com ambergris is a solid waxy substance originating in the intestines of the sperm whale nice it is best known for its use to stabilize the scent of fine perfume so we've gone from a sperm whale's gut to stabilizing fine perfumes because why not of course why not I, I, what what better use <laughs> Ambergris floats and washes ashore most frequently on the coast of China, Japan, Africa, and the Americas, and on tropical islands such as the Bahamas. Because it was picked up as drift along the shores of the North Sea, ambergris was likened to the amber, 
of that same region, and its name is derived from the French words for gray amber, ombre gris. French ambergris is black and soft and has a disagreeable odor, as you can so, imagine, coming right out of a whale's gut. Right, and let's use it in perfume. Exactly. Well, you've got to let it percolate around the ocean for a little while before it's really usable uh, um, because it, uh, when it's exposed to the sun and air and seawater, it gets harder, it fades to a light gray or yellow, and it develops a very subtle and pleasant fragrance while it's going through that whole process. Isn't that amazing? Uh, that actually is amazing. Ambergris, an amazing substance. Let's so, learn more, shall we? So it's like cement. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> um, in a, um, 2016, a website called food52.com uh, had an article about ambergris. You might be wondering why would uh, food52.com oh, be... Oh, um, no, no. Be, uh, yeah, no, it actually can be used as food and has been throughout history and even yet still today. Um, 3,000 years ago, the Chinese had a name for it. They called it Dragon Spittle Fragrance. No, uh, wait a minute. Dragon's yeah. Spittle Fragrance. So what does Dragon Spit um, smell like? I would think it would be fire and smoky, but I, maybe I'm thinking of a, sm <laughs> a fire-breathing dragon. But anyway, the, uh, the Chinese did, I think, have some reverence for dragons. They had some uh, deity attached to them, so perhaps they uh, assimilated a... A uh, pleasant uh, smell with that notion of dragon spittle fragrance. <laughs> now, of course, as I mentioned earlier, its ability to stabilize a scent and perfume makes it uh, makes any smell that it touches last for days. In fact, uh, Marie Antoinette, uh, let them eat cake, right? Well, she wore a scent that contained ambergris. And, of course, they say that uh, after she was beheaded, you could still smell it for weeks after. Oh, I just made that part yeah, up. Right. Yeah. Fun fact. Yeah, that doesn't go. happen to be true. Um, Coco Chanel used ambergris in her original formula for Chanel Number no. 5. Now, it had other qualities as well and other uses. Even a 1,000 years ago, a 10th century Muslim trader called Ibn Hawkal said that Turks used ambergris to treat male impotence. Why not? Right. Of uh -huh. course. Yeah. And 800 years later, none other than Casanova. He added uh, ambergris to chocolate, uh, to chocolate mousse, actually, and used it as an, as an aphrodisiac, although I have a feeling the chocolate was probably more useful than the ambergris. It's also alleged that in the late 1600s, King uh, Charles uh, II, that's the English King Charles II, he died after his favorite breakfast, ambergris and eggs, was poisoned. His favorite breakfast of ambergris well, and eggs. loved ambergris and eggs, yeah. Lovely. Oh, yeah, we, can you imagine being the guy that had to procure the king's ambergris because it's hard <laughs> and, to find? And prepare it. And prepare it, and, right. and this proves that people will eat exactly. anything. In fact, it was used in hot chocolate for many, many years back in the 17 and 1800s because chocolate was thought to have healing qualities and the ambergris was, uh, was thought to enhance those healing qualities. Now, that same article notes that ambergris appears in literature, most notably no, uh, Moby Dick. The of course great, it does. The great tale of, by uh, Herman Melville. Now, there's a great quote from Herman Melville about uh, ambergris. He said, Fine ladies and gentlemen should regale themselves with the essence that's found in an inglorious bowels of a sick whale. Rather ironic, he thought. Now, note that this article states that until recently, ambergris was used in perfumes. And, uh, in fact, uh, Wikipedia notes that today there is a synthetic substance called ambroxide, that's now commonly used instead of ambergris. But there is a uh, company in France called Jovan Perfumery, and they have recently come out with a new fragrance that, in fact, still uses ambergris. They call it a luxury scent. Um, in fact, to launch the new scent, they held an exclusive event at their swanky London retail establishment. I threw in the word swanky myself because I can just imagine a swanky party to introduce this new uh, scent. In fact, they even had ambergris snacks at this party. Can, you want to guess how much an ambergris uh, snack might uh, cost? I uh, more than I'm going to pay for it. Exactly. Let me just well, say that. <laughs> well, they listed it at 100 pounds, which is roughly 130 dollars uh, in the United States. So that was a pretty expensive bite. Um, they had a lot of VIP guests at this uh, party, but the most famous one was a four-legged one, a black Labrador named Dash. Dash uh, was a professional ambergris searcher dog. Evidently, dogs seem to be really good at sniffing out the ambergris. Dash had traveled all the way from Ireland to see 
uh, her find being savored on a plate. Doesn't now, say did, whether she got any or not. That's there. right. That's what I was going to ask. Did she protect? <laughs> she probably turned her nose up at it. Uh, they actually. probably gave her something else to eat. Hopefully, Dash made that long trip from Ireland to London. Anyway, being one of the most uh, expensive ingredients in perfumery, an average size stone of ambergris can reach several th- hundred thousand pounds in price. And notice I've said pounds, not dollars, using the British uh, unit of uh, currency, and I'll explain why in a little bit. Uh, it's perhaps most famous, again, as it's a natural fixative in perfumery. Ranging in its color and smell, every ambergris is truly unique and extremely hard to get hold of. A British publication called The Echo reports that in 2012, a piece of ambergris weighing about a pound was found by a schoolboy on a nature walk. And I love the title of this article, Leah. It says, Schoolboy Rich After Finding Moby Sick. Oh. Isn't that great? All those British uh, wow. folks are so, so <laughs> clever uh, with the language. Of course, it was their language to begin with. A schoolboy has stumbled across a rare piece of whale vomit, which could be worth a staggering 40,000 pounds. That's roughly $60,000. Officially called ambergris, the substance is highly sought after and, as we mentioned before, is used to prolong the scent of perfume. Much to the amazement of his parents, Charlie Naismith made the discovery at Hendixbury Head, which is in southern England near Southampton. H-E-N-G-I-S-T-B-U-R, Hendixbury Head. That's better than I would do. Right, very good. Uh, His find doesn't look like much. Uh, in fact, most of us would probably walk right past it thinking it was a stone. But Charlie was curious enough to pick it up, and after a bit of research, he and his family discovered its potential value. And Pretty so nice find on a, on a nature walk, don't absolutely. you think? So they, so they sold it for the money exactly, rather than eat it. They, yeah, they think they were smart. <laughs> they were wise in doing that. <laughs> but that, that's an amazing story to just find what looks like a rock and turn it into how much was it sixty thousand well, dollars or forty thousand our equivalent pounds? to sixty thousand dollars exactly wow. now it's fortunate he found it in england not in the united states because as you've noticed i haven't uh, been giving the uh, the price in dollars but rather in pounds and okay. there's a reason for that you see according to that uh, food 52 article i mentioned earlier uh possession of and trade of ambergris in the United States is prohibited by the Endangered Species Act of 1973. I believe they were fear, uh, fearful that um, people might actually go out and kill whales to actually try to find ambergris. But it's really not found within the whale itself. It's found in the ocean after it's passed through the whale. And so, um, but yet they are being overly cautious, I suppose. So it's illegal to possess in the United States, but not in Europe. Uh, there's an article from the British Natural Museum of uh, History. That states that in the U.K. and Europe, all living species of whales, dolphins, and porpoises are protected by the law. However, uh, the, um, the European Commission on International Trade in Endangered Species considers ambergris a waste product of a sperm whale that occurs naturally. So it's legal for Europeans to own, possess, buy, sell, and trade ambergris not for Americans. So a, if, if you uh, go on vacation and you find a that's piece. That's right. If you find it, you, you better sell it in Europe before you get on the plane to come back right. home because the United States Customs uh, Department will, will lift it from you as you come back through the airport. Now, we mentioned that uh, it was uh, thought to be whale vomit originally, but more recently it's been uh, uh, pr- um, found to be not whale vomit but has coming out the other end of the whale. Um, that makes it... So much more appetizing. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not actually vomit. So it kind oh. of breaks the breaks the theme oh, of what we're wow. um, uh, <laughs> dealing with. A, a recent article in that same Icon uh, London magazine says that modern researchers have confirmed that ambergris is not regurgitated by the whale as vomit. Instead, it forms in the lower regions of the animal, in the intestine or the bowel. Now, why does it do this? A lot of people have tried to figure it out. Researchers have had uh, great arguments and carried on for weeks about why does the whale produce ambergris. But the best uh, idea and the most uh, uh, largest consensus of why is that it, uh, it functions as a mechanism for uh, protecting the whale's gut from squid beaks. You okay, see, that, uh, makes, that makes sense. I didn't realize squid had beaks until I read this article, but uh, evidently squid have hard parrot-like uh, sharp beaks, and they can rip the lining of a whale's intestine because they can't digest those beaks. And so the whale produces this substance that surrounds those beaks, and uh, then they all pass out of the whale uh, 
together and harden as they get into the sea. In fact, they often find squid beaks in pieces of ambergris. So that seems to uh, explain where it comes from, how it develops its uh, lovely scent after it uh, <laughs> sits around in the ocean for a little while. That is something that has yet to be, be, be determined, but it is certainly true that it does. So there you go, Leah. Ambergris, all you wanted to know. I thought to be strange vomit, but uh, maybe not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's going to bring us to the trivia challenge. Uh, and it, speaking of the trivia challenge, last week's question, we have a winner. Uh, the, the trivia challenge question was, what balloon-related in- event that turned out to be a hoax had everyone glued to their TV sets in October of 2009? And we had Stephanie... Castle Schultz. She is our very first winner of our Yay, very Stephanie. first trivia challenge. And uh, and she answered correctly by saying by telling us about the Balloon Boy hoax. It right. occurred on October 15th, 2009 when a homemade helium-filled gas balloon shaped to resemble a flying saucer was released into the atmosphere above Fort Collins, Colorado by Richard and I think it's Mayumi Heen. They then claimed that their six-year-old son Falcon which that's an appropriate name for this, mm-hmm. was trapped inside of it and flying away. Authorities confirmed that the balloon reached 7,000 feet during the 90-minute flight, an hour-and-a-half flight. The event attracted worldwide attention. I remember watching this on TV, and Falcon was nicknamed Balloon Boy in the media. National Guard helicopters and local police pursued the balloon, and after flying for more than an hour and approximately 50 miles, the balloon landed about 12 miles northwest of Denver International Airport. When Falcon was not found inside, it was reported that an object had been been seen falling from the balloon, and a search was begun. Uh-huh. But later that day, the boy was found hiding in the attic of his house, where he had apparently been <laughs> the entire time. The entire time. And honestly, if they had thought to, if, if I remember watching this, and I right. remember a friend being really on top of it, saying, "There's no way the boy is alive yeah. inside a helium field filled balloon." Right. Yeah, so no oxygen. that's right. You think. And so for today's trivia challenge, Steve, you want to tell us how that works? Exactly. I love trivia, and we've got a great trivia challenge. There's three steps. Listen carefully so that you'll know what to do. Number one. Like and follow our Facebook page, which is at Remnant Stew Podcast. Number two, like and share this episode post, Shark Bait. And number three, put your answer to the trivia challenge question in the comments of that post. The first person to do all that will be the big winner. And what do they win? We have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> if we find any ambergris, it is totally yours. Uh, we are yeah, mailing well, you'll have it to, sneak to it you. Past customs, but yes. <laughs> no, you will be a winner of something. We just don't know yet, but it'll be something. Oh, yes. Uh, you, you, there will be something headed your way. At least our good thoughts and wishes. That's right. And accolades. Accolades, too. All the accolades. Exactly. So our feature story mentioned a tattoo. And I'm going to word this. I'm going to try to word this in such a way that a three-second Google search doesn't give you the answer. So this famous man that lived 100 years ago affectionately nicknamed his children Dash and Dot. Dash and Dot. Tell me who he was and how he was unknowingly affiliated with modern tattooing. Dash and dot and tattooing. Now, that sounds like an interesting co- connection. So go to our Facebook page uh, and tell us what you think. Exciting. That's all we have today for marine life regurgitation, tattoos, and murder. Remember, folks, you can see pictures pertain- pertaining to today's episode as well as participate in the discussion and the trivia challenge over on our Facebook page. And if you have an idea for a story. Oh, we love ideas. We live on ideas. Exactly. If you, would, if you have an idea that you would like us to cover, you can send us a message through Facebook or you can send me an email. The address is leah at remnantstew.com. That's L-E-A-H at remnantstew.com. Before you go, please hit the subscribe button so you won't miss an episode. Maybe take time to give us a review on iTunes. Share us with your friends, family, hairdresser, and parole officer or anybody else that you might come in contact. And until next time, remember, as you travel through this crazy world, please choose to be kind. And always stay curious. Bye-bye.